Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Poetry Salon Cast. I'm your host, Tricia Faye Hefner. And I'm Callie Grace Thomas. On each episode, we interview one of our favorite poets to ask what got them started writing and what keeps them going. And my favorite question, what do they do with a rough draft that wants to play rough? Then we ask for advice that we and you, our listeners, can use in our own writing practices. Without further ado, welcome to this week's episode of the Poetry Salon Cast. Hello, Poetry Salon cast listeners. Thank you all for being here. Today we are going to be interviewing my dear friend and longtime poetry colleague, Alexis Roan Fancher. Alexis, you and I met in a really serendipitous way, I think. I had published a poem called I Will Arise and Go to Los Angeles online. Jessica Wilson Cardenas had published that poem of mine. And I think one day I just got an email from someone I didn't know that said, I like this poem. I'd like to publish it in Cultural Weekly. And from there, you and I struck up a relationship. And as it turns out, we had a lot of other friends and even my relatives in common with you. And so we have been uh, collaborating and sharing work ever since. And I'm so delighted to have you on the podcast this morning. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Absolutely. So would you start us off with a couple of poems, please? Okay. This first one was written a couple of years ago. It was first published in the San Pedro River Review. It starts with an epigraph from Rita Dove's poem, Canary. And the name of the poem is She Says Stalker, He Says Fan. She's a singed torch, a broken cord, the slip shadow between superstar and the door. She's that long stretch of longing, riding shotgun from nowhere to L.A., a bottle of Jack Daniels snug between her thighs, always some fresh loser at the wheel. She's the zippo in your darkness, a glimmer of goddess in your godforsaken life, her voice a rasp a whiskey-tinged caress. She gets you, and you know the words to all her songs. Follow her from dive bar to third-rate club, clapping too loudly, making sure she makes it home. She's as luckless in love as you are, star-crossed, the pair of you in your dreams. If only we could choose who we love. Tonight, the bartender pours her obsession one on the house, dims the lights in the half-empty room as she walks on stage, defenseless, but for that 0018 Rosewood Martin, she cradles in her lap like a child. If you ask nicely, she'll end with the song you request night after night about the perils of unrequited love. You'll blurt out your worship into her deaf ear while her fingers strum your forearm and her nails break your skin. Give the lady whatever she wants, you'll tell the barkeep, like that's even possible. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just love that last line, Alexis. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love this poem. It's traveled. It's traveled quite well. It's going to be in a movie coming up next year. Anyway, what movie? a movie. Yeah. You wanted a second poem. I'm going to mm-hmm. read something lovely and salacious that was published uh, earlier this year in Plume. It's called Sweet Tooth. The man in the window is cheesecake. If I could soar across Main Street and land in his arms, I'd eat him for dessert. He's caramel poured in those low-slung jeans. A sugar daddy lasts forever if you lick it right. (laughs) He's marzipan, clean cut, the jut of his hip bone reflecting the sun. I'm come undone by the clockwork of his days, his devil's food dismount from that Shimano aluminum bike, how he disappears inside the foyer. If he were mine, 
I'd ride him like a stolen bicycle. He strips down to sweet meat Monday through Friday, 5 p.m., happy hour when he hangs the bike on the wall and me happy to watch his muscles ripple. He stretches out on the bed, my creature of habit, his old Henry straining against its wrapper. This, I know, he's an all-day sucker. He doesn't believe in drapes. There you go. <laughs> I that have this sultry one. <laughs> I know I have the same reaction. I'm sitting here trying really hard not to giggle. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Yeah, it's so Man, fun. That, that line with the O. Henry bar. Oh, this is great. I know, straining against his O. Henry. <laughs> yeah. All right, Alexis, thank you so much for being here. Alexis, I'm sure you get this question a lot, as we all do, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your origin story as a poet? What was the spider that bit you? Uh, how did you get started with this? Hmm. Wow. I wrote as a child. I wrote as a college student. I wrote in high school. Mostly poetry, it seemed to be the natural form for me. Um, I started writing seriously in 2008, studying with Jack Grapes for five years, and uh, then decided to write for publication and started submitting my work in, the, I think, around October of 2012. When you say you started writing seriously, I'm really curious what that means to you, what the distinction is. Like a job, like realizing that I was chock full of things I wanted to say and needed to put on paper, uh, needed to communicate. I'd always wanted to be a full-time writer and life made me do things like be a mom and an advertising rep and finally reached the point where I could just write full time and went into it with great gusto as a second career. Mm. Mm -hmm. So Alexis, when you were working in advertising and being a mom, were you kind of tinkering around with stuff or you kind of just entered full force? I've always kept, uh, I wouldn't call it a journal, but everything from drawings to, to poems to things I like from other people, always kept uh, notebooks. And the notebooks started to take on more of a formal aspect. Uh, I, I wrote a novel that I finished in 2010 called Annie's Sinful Nature. Uh, mm -hmm. that I wrote while I was studying with Jack Grapes and every week I would bring in another page of the novel and read it aloud to the class. It gave me a sense of continuity. It gave me a sense of what it takes to produce something hopefully of quality week after week after week. It gave me an excellent work ethic as far as, as writing, which I follow to this day. I write every day. I write for four hours. And that I learned writing for Jack's class. Um, I, I want to ask you a little bit about that, because I am familiar with your novel, Annie's Sinful Nature. I think I've seen it um, like on your shelf a couple times when I've been over. And I've, I've mainly known you as a poet. And I'm curious how you made that switch. Do you ever go back to writing in prose? Or what, what helped you... Um, kind of make that switch over to poetry? Well, I now I write back and forth. I've, I've had a number of flash fiction pieces published, um, short stories, flash nonfiction. I'm writing a graphic novel right now. Well, actually a pictographic noir novel written in flash. So maybe you could call it prose poems, maybe you could call it flash. Uh, mm. So it'll be, it's, I'm about 5,000 words into a 60,000 word novella. 
uh, called My Criminal Boyfriend. Nice. So Bonnie and Clyde <laughs> in the 70s with drugs. So I, I write back and forth, and I'm finding more and more that, that, as Jack says, the only difference between poetry and prose is the mm -hmm. length of lines. Mm -hmm. For me, there's no transition. It's all writing. I love that you're working on so many different exciting things. I'm curious. I'm always so curious with your process, Alexis, because you are so disciplined and you said you work four hours a day. Um, do you switch between projects or do you usually kind of like say like this week I'm working on this and just dive in and then switch gears the following week? When I first started writing, I had a very uh, delightful half hour private conversation with the great Ray Bradbury mm. in uh, a bar in uh, Century City. And uh, I, was, I was young and naive and I asked the, the dumb question, so how do you combat writer's block, Mr. Bradbury? And he said, I'm working on 10 different projects at a time. I have a project on my computer. I have another one on a yellow pad at the toilet. I have another ah. one in my workshop. I have another one in the kitchen uh, next to the toaster and another one. So that he said, and I, I never write till the end of anything. I always write and stop when I know the next line. I know what the next line is going to be. And he said, and I switch. And that way, if something's not going well, you know, write something else. So I usually have five or six, ten poems going at once. So something starts really cooking for me, then I'll hone in on it. I, I, I like working on a lot of things at once. Uh, yeah. keeps it fresh, don't you yeah. think? Absolutely. Yeah. Hemingway also did that. I, yeah, I totally agree too. Like I love having multiple projects because when you do get stuck in one, you can switch to another and never get bored. But I will say, Alexis, knowing you and your very strong worth, work ethic as I do, I think you are a really um, good example of someone who finishes projects too. Like, and Kelly, you as well. I mean, I sit on a poem and wait 10 years after I finished it and go back and change every word before I send it out. But both <laughs> of you two are just like, yeah, I think that's done. I'm going to go send it out now. And it's frequently published before, you know, before you've lost a night's sleep over it. So I want to commend both of you for that. Um, and then also, Alexis, I want to ask about your process of finishing work, because even though you work on multiple things at once, I mean, it's pretty clear that you do know when to say, boy, that's done, and then get it to market. It depends. It depends. I'm working on a poem right now that, damn, you know, I, I keep thinking it's done, and then I I send it out. I, I, I work with a number of really fine poets, often yourself included, who function, we function for each other as editors, some paid, some reciprocal, but my poems traditionally, normally will go six, eight, ten drafts mm. is normal for me, and I'll be sending it to different poets, depending on the subject matter, depending on what I think is missing or the feedback that I think I can get. I have one friend who is perfect with line breaks, perfect grammatically, you know, and I'm not bad, but she's spectacular. I'll send her something and she'll go, well, you know, maybe on line three, you should be have a semicolon after things like that, that really matter in a poem. Um, Things that maybe I missed, I didn't see. Sometimes I, I will send it to one person or no one. And like you said, I'll know it's good. Accustomed to Dead Kids, that poem um, that's making the rounds now and is in my new book. I just made sure that it was line for line, word for word, exactly the same cadence, the same number of syllables, the same rhythm that the, the poem worked. But I didn't... Yeah anybody i just sent it out wow and for those of you who haven't checked it out yet the accustomed to dead kids poem is a poem that you were modeling after a song called i've grown accustomed to her face which is in my fair lady but it's 
I've grown accustomed to dead kids, which is obviously about more of the mass shootings and other ways kids are killed in this day and age and in this country. And I would encourage listeners to check it out. I think that brings us to the other question. You know, there's probably not just one answer to this, but I'm curious about your writing process in general. How do you generate work when you sit down for that four hour stint of writing? Mm -hmm. What's the first thing that you do? Huh. When I get up in the morning, uh, I usually get up quite early. I'm an early riser. I live in a beautiful space on, on the bluffs of San Pedro, and it's an eastern view, and I arise with the sunrise, and I meditate in the morning, maybe five, ten minutes, make myself a cup of coffee, and go to work. It's almost Pavlovian. If you do it, you do it every day, you have the same rhythm, and you sit down, and for me, I'm very fortunate the muses show up. They might show up for one poem or another. They might show up, you know, and I pretty much let them have their way. Mm. But I will be working on, usually on something that's ongoing, something that's new. Every once in a while, I have really nothing, you know, in in the pot. It's cooking up, and I sit there and look at the blank page, and it's everything, and it's welcoming, and it scares the you-know-what. <laughs> <laughs> me too, it's me too. blank page. And yeah. And sometimes I'll use a prompt uh, that that works for me, or someone will write and say, I'm doing an anthology, and here's the prompt. Let me know if something shows up for you, and maybe mm. it does. And sometimes I'll just, what was that time when, when I was in your, your writing class, Tricia, and you said, I want you to take all your orphan lines from all the poems that you've cut these lines from and make a poem. Yes. And bring it into class next week, and I did just that and it was I never slept with a Mexican before he would only do it in the dark and Mm. all of these beautiful lines that never worked before I put them all together and brought it in with not much hope and you said this is the best thing you've ever written (laughs) (laughs) it went on to be published in Stream and Chiron Review and nominated for a push card and that was so much fun and simple so you never know where a poem's going to be. You never yeah. know. Be open, right? Be curious. Yeah, absolutely. A- oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kelly. Sorry. Just while we're in the process of that creative, you know, your writing time, one thing I know about you, Alexis, is you are just such a fierce submitter and your work is out there. I feel like some poets kind of have like stagnant water where stuff just builds up. And like Trisha said, you're always turning. How does submission fall into your creative process? Is that completely different? Or do you use that during your four hours? That's after my four hours. I redo a trope. I read crops. I read probably 30, 40 different uh, lit mags online every week. Mm -hmm. Not every poem, but, you know, I, I look at the title. I read the first stanza, I read the last stanza, and then if it's something of interest, I read the poem. But I really have my finger on the pulse of what's being published where, and I try very hard to send each literary magazine the poems I think that they would resonate with, that they they would be interested in publishing. So there's that matching up. Um, I don't right. just send out 10 poems to 10 places like a shotgun approach. I'm very careful about where my work goes. And I've been doing this a long time. I, I submit at least five places a week, at least every week. Something comes back, rejected, it goes back out the same day, maybe in a different form, maybe with different other poems. But I usually have 15 or 20 things out at any one time. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a scheme, you know, how can you be published if if you don't put your work out there? And to people like, I'm so afraid it's my work. <laughs> no, it's not your work. <laughs> it's not your heart. It's not your firstborn. It's product. I think right. being in advertising and selling advertising for 30 years, 
I got very quickly that it wasn't me that was being rejected if someone said, no, I don't want to be in your publication. It was my publication was a widget. My publication was product, just like my writing. And if the writing is good and you believe in what you've written, then you have to stand behind it and you have to put it out there. So, yeah, that's kind of the long answer. I really like that idea, and I think that's such a useful way of looking at publication. This is a widget. This is something that I created, and it's yep. it's just, it's not personal. Like, these are the <laughs> journals that are looking for a widget, and these are the journals that are not looking for this particular widget. But at the same time, I find that really interesting that you're the one saying that because so much of your work, from my experience, seems to be... Uh, rooted in autobiography, and I, I choose that term carefully because, of course, no poem is pure autobiography, and even those poems that seem to be rooted in biography are not necessarily direct biography, and there is an important distinction to be made there. Could you talk a little bit about how the the biography, the biographical information informs your writing? I consider myself a confessional poet. Mm -hmm. I know it's kind of an outmoded term in some ways, but I write about my life. I write about what I see, what I've experienced, and I'm, I'm not 25, I'm not 40. I'm an older woman who's lived a rather full and extraordinary, in my way of looking at it, life. I've been married three times, I'm bisexual, I've traveled all over the world, I have an extraordinarily close relationship with my sister who has given me carte blanche to write everything about our lives together and her <laughs> sense, uh, everything from, from the men we've shared to the trauma of her having a, a drug addicted child. Mm. I've been very fortunate in that the people in my life are thrilled that I write about them, uh, that I have a husband who is uh, very understanding. At, at, at meetings probably 2010, people would come up to me and say, oh my God, my first, my first love affair was with my cousin in the closet, and I know you know what I'm talking about, and this mm. is gay, or uh, let me tell you what happened to me. And what I got was two things, that I could connect with other human beings on a very visceral level and that everything, people think that everything I write happened. To dissuade them of that is not a good thing. That anything can be taken and, and made your own and why should I say no? It didn't happen. Why is that necessary? Why can't you believe whatever you want about what I write? So that's where I'm at. Everything happened. It's all true. I love that. That's so interesting. Ocean Vuong has kind of like this approach or perspective where he says that once you write a poem and you put it out into the universe, you have no more attachment to how that's interpreted. So if someone wants to think that this absolutely happened or they want to it interpret it that way, he says it's like none of the readers, none of the poet's business, that it's all with the reader. So I really love that idea of letting the reader just go with whatever story connects them more and enthralls them more. Yes. I get a lot of emails, a lot of, I don't know if you call it fan mail, but people who write to me. And it's always about the connection and giving them permission. I think I hear this more often than anything is your writing has given me permission to tell my story, face my fears, write my own erotica and, you know, screw anybody that doesn't like it. Be free. If not now, when is what I say to people at readers. Right. <laughs> I would love to write like you do, but I'm afraid. And I just say, if not now, when? When you're 30, 40, 80, 100? Why not yeah. now? What's the worst that can happen? Your cousin won't speak to you again? Give me a break. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Be brave. Grow a pair, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that so having... <laughs> uh, 
I think that having that bravery is absolutely essential to the writing process. And I'm curious, Alexis, too, you know, what I heard you say is that you've always been keeping a kind of log of what you've experienced. And certainly you definitely have things that probably have a level of interest that not everybody else has. I mean, I I tend to believe that all life is interesting if you are paying attention to it, no matter how dull. And as Jack, of course, is always saying, your story is boring. I know some writers who can write about the grass growing and it's fascinating and other people who could write about, you know, a threesome with a dictator and a, a clown, a French clown. And it would still be the most boring thing <laughs> I had read that day. It's really more about the writing process. But I'm curious for you, when you're investigating what you want to write about, do you ever go back to those older journals or do you ever find that you're writing about something you experienced before but now you're you've got a new take on it or you've got something new in your craft that allows you to write about it in a different way huh I don't go back over my old journals from you know the the 90s or the 2000s um I do keep a running notebook on my phone in notes where I put down just what I'm thinking. Uh, I don't write longhand. I just type it in and then it's on my computer and I can cut and paste that into a document and start working on it, which I often do. When I go back over my notes, I see that I'd say 80% of the notes I take end up in poems. Maybe not today or tomorrow, maybe in five years, but normally mm. if I've written it down somewhere, it it becomes a poem. I mean, I love I love all this. I love the process. You know what I'm so curious about? <laughs> I wanna hear about the po- I wanna hear about the process of the poems, but I wanna hear about the movie that the poem is gonna be in. I keep on being like, ooh, I wanna know more about that. She says stalker, he says fan poem for the sad waitress at the diner in Barstow, and one other rather obscure poem about a girl who's murdered in the desert were chosen by a producer, director, her name is Susan Lambert. Uh, She's in New York um, and Greece, and she came to me with an idea to do a uh, maybe 15-minute short film about using characters that would appear in all three of these stories over a timeline. So we've been working, she's been out here now twice uh, for, and we're storyboarding and, and we're casting and we have a, uh, she'll be directing and we have, we have a, a, another producer and we have someone who's uh, writing original music and it, Hopefully, you know, will be finished in a year and entered into some uh, film festivals. So that's kind of exciting. Very exciting. Salty. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's going to be quite beautiful. I don't even know what it's going to be called yet. How did you all connect on this project? How did she find you and find your work? Facebook. Originally, we were Facebook friends. Uh, I had spent a great deal of time in Greece. She had lived. She was living in Greece. She interviewed me for a radio show, a blog that she has, and then we became friends. And she came out to LA, and we. I photographed her, and then she came up with this idea. So I'm like, sure, sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, wow. I love that. That's so That's exciting. Fun. You know, I have a, a another question to piggyback off of that. And one thing I've noticed about you, Alexis, is you are a fantastic networker. Yes. And you talk about getting the folks who write journals, the, the what do I want to call them, the gateway keepers, the gatekeepers, befriend all of the poets that run journals and you befriend people who are editors on Facebook. And it seems that you have this constant stream of contacts with other writers. And I'm wondering if you feel that that has helped not just promoting the work once it's finished, but helped enhance your creative idea pool. Can you talk a little bit about what 
contacting, being in contact with other writers has done for your own creativity? I think that that communication between poets, whether it's, you know, working together, uh, doing projects together, promoting other poets' work, publishing them, I think it's essential. I've been very lucky. I fell into the remarkable job of being poetry editor for Cultural Weekly back in the autumn of 2012, and it gave me a an entree into a world that I was just becoming familiar with, really on not the level of, oh my God, I'm reading this great poem, but actually being able to communicate with the poet. I was in sales for a million years. I love people. I, I know how to talk mm. to people. Um, I do know how to network from other jobs that I had over the years. And I think it's just the love of people and wanting to be around brilliant people. I, you know, I just want to be around poets that are better than me. <laughs> me too. I want to learn. I, I want to reach. I want to have them yeah. reach down and say, here, let me, let me help you up, you know. Um, and then I think you have to turn around and, and do that for others. You know? yeah. yeah. I think that's the other side of that. Yeah. But as a result, I've been incredibly lucky because I get to publish people who've turned around and published me, introduced me. Um, I've had mentors like Gerald Laughlin who've taken me under their wing when I was nobody and nobody ever read my work and, and shared me with the world and introduced me to people. I've just been really, really lucky. Yeah, that's so fantastic. And I have been one of the beneficiaries of your community-driven spirit, let's call it, because you're always sharing about my work and about Kelly's and about the Poetry Salon. And it really is such a joy, not just for the creative part, but for the community that we all get to be a part of and get to build and get to hold one another up. It's so exciting and we are I think all of us we get paid back in full for whatever yes. we do to help one another you know it's like the kid when I taught a workshop at Occidental College a poetry workshop for kids that were in transition from high school to college and this one kid raised his hand in the back and he was kind of slung in his chair and he said so uh, what kind of money is there in poetry <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it stayed with me, and, and especially now when everybody is all about money, and, and money is just overwhelming the world and, and, yeah. and grasping greedy Koch brothers of the world. I am so happy that my currency is, our words, is appreciation, is camaraderie, is... Connection. Connection, exactly. Yeah. How spectacular that I my my success is not judged on how many books I sold or how much money I make, but on how I embrace the world. Yeah, I love that. Jericho Brown says the sign of a great poem is a call to action. And a lot of times people think that that's like a political thing, like, oh, I'm going to do this. But if you hear a great poem and you then decide after hearing that poem to call your mother for the first time in five years, that that changes you. And that, I, you know, on that sort of similar topic too, the poem that you read, the first one, The Sweet Tooth, one thing that, you know, some poets may not realize, getting published as a quote unquote erotic poet is no easy feat and certainly there is a lot of I want to call it highbrow poetry written and published that has eroticism in it there's a tendency sometimes I think to dismiss erotic poetry as being not very serious or not very lofty and you're one of the few poets that I know personally who is consistently writing poems that could be considered erotic or as you say you know confessional poetry and that's getting them published and one of those poems is in the best American poets of 2016 
And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what that means to you and why do you think it is that these poems are getting taken more seriously? When I first started sending out, uh, quote unquote, uh, erotic poems, I remember uh, getting, you know, and I sent them to really high end journals like, you know, Hangman and, and uh, Hank and places like that. And, and I kept getting back these lovely notes saying, I don't like erotica, but I love your work. Mm -hmm. I'd like to publish White Flag, or I'd like to publish, you know. If when people ask me about writing sex, I tell them to write the space around it. Mm -hmm. People get very shy about, about calling a penis a penis, or calling a dick a dick, or a vagina a vagina, but it's not necessarily about the language. It's about the act. It's about the, the sensuality around it. So that when you are specific, it's not crude. And it's not euphemistic. I got some woman sent me her erotica and it had come right out of the Victorian age with <laughs> his member and shuddering. And I was like, oh, fuck, you know. <laughs> No, no. I, my, my good friend, uh, Rich Ferguson, uh, a few years back, he and I and Rick Lupert and uh, Elizabeth Adwin Edwards did a, a lit crawl event at a uh, sex shop. And my call <laughs> to give them was to write something erotic and we would do a, you know, a round robin sort of thing. And uh, about a week later, I get a call from Rich saying, Writing this erotic is a lot harder than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> my hat off to you. And as yes. we know, Rich takes his hat off, never. So <laughs> it was, yeah, I mean, I think people think it's easy. It's not. I think you have to write the space around it. I, I also think you've pointed this out before. And I think part of the reason that your poetry is successful is that even though there is eroticism in it, it's not ever just for the sake of tantalizing people with sexuality. There's always something in it that it's not always about sex, it's about power. And sex is yes. the vehicle for showing that, but it's also about power dynamics. And I would say it's also about personal knowledge and exploration and that's why I think there's always something in your poetry that transcends the erotic genre as it is typically thought of. Right because basically well thank you for that but basically I'm not writing about sex at all you know it's like some people write about fishing <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. might not be about the trout and the trout might be you know about something else but they're couching it in fishing terms and fishing language well I can give you the quote because it's probably the best way it was in the femme a few years back and the quote uh -huh. is this I write about women like me women who own their sexuality and take responsibility for their choices it may seem I'm writing about sex but really I'm writing about power, who has <laughs> it, how to get it, how to wield it, how to keep it. Yes. Uh, yeah. That is exactly the quote I was thinking right of from earlier. It's power. I believe it was uh, Oscar Wilde and I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of it. You know, if you had to ask me. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think this is sort of what I find a little remarkable that, you know, you said earlier, I'm not, this is not my baby, this is not my firstborn, this is a widget I created, and yet it is rooted for you in some stuff that's very close to the heart and close to your own personal experiences, and yet you still are able to depersonalize it when you turn it into poetry. And I think that that is such a valuable skill for writers to learn. This is personal, it's not personal. It's totally something that I'm using to share with other people it's totally not about me at all it gives other people permission it's not a reflection of me personally you know that is such a hard oh such a hard road to hoe and a hard distinction to make well i think people who think of their work as precious are in for incredible <laughs> sadness and disappointment <laughs> and 
what I like best is people who really get that I, I have a sense of humor, that I write a lot of very funny stuff. I had someone, I, I read at the Annenberg recently with uh, Red Hen, and some woman came up to me and she said, I have never laughed so hard <laughs> at anything, let alone at a poetry reading. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. That made my day, you know, because sex is funny. Life is funny. If we can't laugh at it, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big time. problems. I wanted to piggyback, if you don't mind, real quick on the quote power. And I love that so much. And I love that the power you establish in your poems. And I'm wondering kind of about how perhaps poetry has influenced your sense of self-empowerment or how you might have seen changes in who you are as a person since you began seriously writing? Interesting question. Were you always this strong and badass, Alexis? (laughs) (laughs) Is basically what I'm asking. (laughs) Yes, and as I've gotten older, I'm kind of like Helen Mirren. She says, I wish I'd said no a lot more. I wish I'd you know, said fuck a lot more. But I, I was very fortunate. I had very strong parents, very loving, who knew early on I was an artist who nurtured that in me and, and, and said, whatever you want to be, as long as you get a PhD in it, we don't care. So <laughs> I'm going to go to college, not where, if it was where, Where would you go to grad school? You know, it it was all about empowering myself to be the best that I could be. And I learned early on that unless I'm I'm out there and forging my own way in life, no one's going to forge it for me. No Mm -hmm. one's going to knock on the door of my closet where I sit there writing my poetry night after night and say, (laughs) man, we heard you really good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so I learned that, that I'm just going to go out there and be my most authentic self and hope that that resonates for somebody but you know until you're writing about the stuff I'm, and here I'm paraphrasing one of my favorite writers Dorothy Allison who wrote Bastard Out of Carolina among other things she said until you're writing about the stuff that is really painful the stuff that you just can't write about mm. you're not writing worth a damn and if you're not writing mm. worth a damn why should anybody bother to read it hmm. that's your responsibility yep. yeah and that she's, is you don't know how to do it fake it write like you think you know what you're doing we'll get back to our interview in just a moment In the meantime, if you want to get more support for your own writing or learn more about the craft of poetry, check out our services at www.thepoetrysalon.com. You can learn more about poetry by taking one of our e-courses or get feedback on your own writing by joining one of our editing classes. The Poetry Salon is a community of intrepid writers who support one another through in-person and online services. One more time, that's thepoetrysalon.com. You can also reach me directly with any questions that you have at trisha at thepoetrysalon.com. Now, back to our podcast. Welcome back for the second half, Alexis. And I want to talk now about your revision process a little bit more and the two poems that you read, Sweet Tooth and she says stalker he says fan can you talk a little bit about how the first one came how that was generated and what made it work for you with sweet tooth until recently i lived in downtown la and i would wander the city i shoot a lot of photographs and at the end of the afternoon i would end up at the artisan house which is a lovely, very high ceiling, beautiful restaurant on 6th and Main for happy hour. And if I sat at a certain table near the window, I had a perfect view of the apartment building across the street. It had a wide foyer uh, and a view of the windows of the apartments up above. And every day at five o'clock, this gorgeous man would ride up on his Shimano bicycle dismount and walk his bike into the building 
And then maybe four or five minutes later, he'd reappear in an upstairs window. And one day, you know, and he'd take his shirt off and he was just, (laughs) and I started photographing him and I had this thought and it was, if he were mine, I'd ride him like a stolen bicycle. (laughs) And I wrote it down on my phone in my notes and uh, the poem came from that. And I'm here at my computer looking at the photo of this gorgeous half naked man in the window. So this poem came very easily and I, I was working, actually I think this came about Kelly when you were doing that metaphor workshop you had mm-hmm. done it, and I had pages of notes it was so great and I thought <laughs> I'd idea for you to teach it because I think you're so great at metaphor among oh. many other things and thank you I just put every single candy and marzipan and every type of thing I could think of into this poem and there you are it just I think it had three drafts it was very easy not my usual Yeah, that was fantastic. And I think that's something that I hear a lot with poets is, you know, you're taking the notes and you're kind of letting it simmer in your head. And then one day somebody gives you the exercise that allows you to put it all together. So, you know, in some ways it's like the poems come easy, but only because you've done the prep work in advance. Mm. Um, Maybe even on an unconscious level, you're just interested in something, you know, it's just there in the back of your mind. And then one day the, the right prompt gets you to write about it and then it comes out kind of fully formed. I think that's kind of what happened with She Says Stalker, He Says Fan. The prompt was with, it was for San Pedro River Review, and the prompt was the music issue. Mm. And so they Mm. have kind of a a very particular aesthetic. They like gritty. They like, you you just get a feel. It's, 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 again, you know, knowing the market that you're writing for. So for in this case, I wrote this poem for that issue of the magazine. I just started thinking about music and how it affected me and if it was dark and I love writing in noir. In fact, Suzanne Lummis used this poem in her noir uh, series a few months back, uh, Hmm. which was very, very flattering. But I, I just started thinking about you know, this this young girl and, and very young girl and how she's trying to make it, but she's got bad habits and bad luck and bad timing and a stalker who just really tries to get her home for the night without her getting drunk and, and killing herself on the road. But how nice really is he? Yeah, yeah, right. that dark undercurrent. It's- ulterior motive. And here, he, you know, we've all had people in love with us who were clueless and and it's unrequited and yet they go out of their way to to kind of be there for you and if you don't end up on forensic files maybe (laughs) so tell us about the genesis of that one i mean you you talked about kind of what um got it started so i guess what i want to ask is tell us about the wrestling with it and the revision of it did that one just come out fully formed or did you have to work for that one uh, these, what, 300 words came out, 247, no, maybe a 240 word poem took probably 10 drafts. Wow. Uh, the first draft, I just started writing down maybe two, three pages of everything I could think of on the road with the, the semis and the cars and who is she and what would she have with her and how would she be dressed and you know, I started to get a visual picture of who this woman was and what she wanted and why she was the way she was. So, you know, you start out curious about your character, right? Mm-hmm. Especially if you're writing this kind of a poem, which is a story, which is mostly what I write. You know, you try to only have one or two characters because it's short. You try to have something about them that allows your reader to have a touchstone, to have something 
as we used to say in, in screenwriting, the, the, the reader can hang their hat on. Mm -hmm. So you want to give them some information, but not too much. Because what you really want to do is touch their imagination such that it becomes their story. Mm. I think it was about two pages, and then I started cutting and cutting and cutting and just started doing drafts. And each draft got bigger and then smaller, and eventually 240 words. And I had what I wanted. You know, I love that idea it gets bigger and smaller it gets bigger and smaller i often think of editing as being a kind of accordion process like hmm. first you go in there and sometimes sometimes it's all about just chiseling away everything's there you just take out what's missing but a lot of the time i find that editing is somebody touched on something and then they didn't say enough about that. And that's where the real interest is. So it's about adding more in. And then they went on too much about like what the moon looked like that night, even though that's not really the most important part of the poem. So you have to cut that out. And then sometimes you even go back in and you're like, oh, well, you, you said that, um, you know, the moon reminded you of her mother and now the mother's more important in the poem you said more about that so now the moon is important and i see why so add that back in and yes. i like to think of it as an accordion you know the accordion expands and then it contracts and it expands and then it contracts and that's where the music comes in oh i like that very much nice metaphor <laughs> yes i've learned from the queen I am now an ambassador <laughs> from the land of metaphors. Oh, man. <laughs> we love it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, do you have a preference for generative writing, or do you enjoy the revision process? For me, it's the best part. It's, it's almost like faceting a, a diamond without anything extra. Take out the adverbs. Take out the adjectives. Find the good verb. Find a great noun. Find words that are perfect and I will I will play around with with the fine-tuning of a poem uh, until there's something there that that shines hopefully in stalker fan my favorite line is uh, she's the zippo in your darkness <laughs> loved the surprise of that line because I thought she's the zippo in your pocket and then you said darkness and it changed everything can you talk a little bit about how you use the element of surprise or what you reach for in terms of revision? I reach for a killer last line. Mm. The surprise, the shock, the, <gasps> I want that. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm working on a, a poem about my mother and myself right now and uh, I'm calling it matriarchal elegy and there's a part in there where I lost my son and my mother had three children and one almost died another almost died but she had extras and mm. at this, I should have had more children mm. so you know and now I'm trying to connect everything so I get there yeah. Well, I think you have to be really careful that it's not forced. Yeah. And some way when you get there, there's an organic process to it such that you don't go, uh, I was manipulated here. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh. You know, Laurel Ann Bogan, the, the great L.A. poet, has. A, I took a workshop from her, and, and one of the things she said is stayed with me, and I've shared it with so many of my students. And, and the, the thing is that when you get to the end of the poem, whether it's your poem or someone else's, you ask yourself one question. So what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you can't answer that and go, oh, my holy Jesus. You know, right. You should go back and redo it or, or start again or, or take a look at it. So what? Yeah. It's sobering and and the great equalizer right yeah 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 <laughs> well and i am wondering with a stalker fan did the ending come naturally to you or is that something that surprised you in the writing uh you know there's that famous quote who is it robert frost he yeah says, no surprise in the writer no surprise in the reader 
Yeah. So what were some of the surprises for you with Stalker Fan? I think really getting inside of her and and as she walks on the stage and she's holding her guitar, which is the only thing that matters to her in her whole mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And everything else is, you know, to have another drink, you know, stuff it down. But the only thing that really, really works for her, which was a, a lovely surprise for me, was when she's on that half empty stage and and having another drink and trying to stuff it down but it's coming out in her music and that poor guy who's so in love with her i don't think i wrote to this ending line as i recall the ending was a surprise to me mm. i love ending on a, 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 a words or images you know, something really strong. And, and there he was, give the lady whatever she wants. And then I thought to myself, yeah, like that's even possible. And I went, oh dear, that, that might work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That work. And you get that little chill or, you know, yeah. And I'm wondering if part of the challenge of this particular poem, uh, you know, you've talked about being a confessional poet and I know so much of your work is kind of rooted in something that really happened. and I would say, I think there are certain poems that happen in our lives and the universe is giving us poems and all we really have to do is get out of our way and record them in such a way that the poetry is more obvious. But when you're also, when you're creating something out of scratch, out of the idea, the glimmer of a character that you have in your head, you have more freedom, but then you also have more responsibility. You have to be responsible for doing all that creation, not just recording it. So I'm wondering if that is part of what, you know, added to the challenge of this poem. No, I think, I think it was just wanting to get the feeling of, you know, I was that young. I played guitar. I had a 0018 Rosewood Martin that I cradled in my lap like a child. I was mm -hmm. that insecure. I did not take the path that this girl took, but I could have. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that could be me. And as I said, this is one of the poems that will be in the movie. And this is the first poem. Yeah, that actually correlates with some writing advice I heard recently, and I really wish I could cite this properly, but like, that's a great writing prompt for everyone. Uh, and maybe we'll, we'll come to a close with a, an optional writing prompt for everyone is, you know, someone who is like you, whether fictional or someone you see out there in the world that you feel you can identify with, but what if you made a different choice? You know, what if instead yeah. of going to Los Angeles, you went to Beirut as you originally intended? What if instead of marrying the one guy, you took your mother's advice and went with the other guy instead? Like, where would that leave you? And letting your mind circulate around that and where that could go. I mean, that's such a rich way of using autobiography to explore fiction or using fiction to explore like a parallel universe autobiography for yourself. Hmm. I often look at the other side of things. I think it's important to do that as an artist. Absolutely. Yes. To look at, at both sides, to look at it, whether whether it's it's politics or it's art or it's uh, country music, you know, you gotta try it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you gotta put your mind there. Um, I often write not from my own life, but from the life of. I, I have a, a new poem that's just been sent out a couple of times about a a woman who goes to the same diner every day and reads Sappho and the <laughs> relation between her and the waitress. And she says, who's Sappho? And the, the speaker says, oh, it's, a, it's a, a poet from ancient Greece. And the waitress picks up this, this greasy uh, plate from the table and she says, I'll show you ancient Greece. <laughs> <laughs> There in it, and they have this conversation. 
So mm. I, I think, you know, your imagination is the best thing. And, and maybe I read a lot of poems that take off from reality and then go somewhere. Mm, yes. It didn't really happen. Although if you ask me at a reading, I'll swear it did. Mm. <laughs> I have this this small fear actually as a poet that one day you know because we all write things that walk the line between truth and reality like I fear one day I'm gonna uh, get older and start to lose my memory and I'll go back and I'll read my poems and I'll be like oh man this is amazing I, I really I was a swan at one point and not know the difference <laughs> <laughs> between the truth and the reality just but you know also Alexis I think that's something that maybe ties back into your community orientation I think one of the really big values of poetry is that it does stimulate the imagination and I don't necessarily mean the imagination as in let's think about unicorns and fantasy but the imagination is one of those things that only human beings have and the whole animal kingdom and part of what we use it for can use it for is not just creating new things but also leaping into the mind of someone else mm. and saying i want to try this on i want to try on that personality or that thought process yes i think it's yeah. very important that a reader can connect that that feels that someone is out there that gets them yeah. That, yes. That has that 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 ability to be empathetic while writing about their own experience. You know, uh, when I turned fourteen, and my mother's sister took me to lunch and said the uh, best American poetry poem uh, has touched so many people because mm -hmm. it it goes back to a time when you're very vulnerable and it's a shared moment. Did it ever happen? Mm. Okay, sure, maybe, but but I have had such a strong response to that with people saying everything from how could your sister betray you to oh my God that happened to me to I wish somebody had had taken me aside at fourteen and told me about the birds and the bees it would have saved me a lot of grief. Yeah, mm. and I think I've told you this story, Alexis. I was in a a bookstore in another state with a person I had just met recently and we had an opportunity to go to a, a bookstore together and she was showing me around and I saw the anthology the best poetry of 2016 and I pulled that poem out and had her read it and she started crying in the bookstore this woman I had really only just started to get to know and after she read that poem she like told me her whole life story in a nutshell and she's like I really wish I had had someone to explain this to me yeah I always say that poetry keeps me company and yeah. that's why I go back to it and Alexis like so many poems that you've written and other poets have written I, I feel less lonely in the world because those poems are out there yeah. thank you I love that thank you yeah. Kelly yeah um also I would like, you know, this is highly unorthodox here at the Poetry Salon, uh, but Alexis, since we've referenced that poem so many times, uh, would you close us out by reading it? Oh, the When I Turned 14? Yeah. Yeah, let me find it. When I turned 14, my mother's sister took me to lunch and said, soon you'll have breasts. They'll mushroom on your smooth chest like landmines. A boy will show up, a schoolmate or the gardener's son, pole cat around you, all brown-eyed persistence. He'll be everything your parents hate. A smart aleck, a dropout, a street racer on the midnight prowl. Even your best friend will call him a loser. But this boy will steal your reason, have you writing his name inside mm -hmm. his scarlet heart, entwined with misplaced passion and a bungled first kiss. He'll bivouac beneath your window, sweet talk you until you sneak out into his waiting complications. Go ahead, tempt him with your newfound glamour, tumble into the back seat of his Ford at the top of Mulholland 
flushed with stardust, his mouth in a death clamp on your nipple, his worshipful fingers scattering sacraments on your clit. Soon he will deceive you with your younger sister, the girl who once loved you most in the world. Mm, man, that, that line about he will steal your reason. Oh, it works on so many levels and it's so good. Don't you remember, you know, your, your notebook and you're, you're, you're putting your name and his name and a heart and your <laughs> yeah. arrows of misfortune. <laughs> mm, absolutely. I have no idea what you two are talking about. That's not anything I would ever do. Uh, Lucky I'm you. Lucky no, you. I'm kidding. I am. I am so like, that was so me. Yes. I was. <laughs> I was the obsessive, compulsive, heartbreak queen in my uh, teen years, uh, and probably like up to you know just this morning. But isn't like that this... kind of what's cool? I mean, that as a as a poet, we can go back to fourteen uh -huh. or sixteen with my uncle mm -hmm. Kenny, or or, or twenty two with the the two members of the l a Rams football team who raped me in my bedroom, and I can go back there. I yeah. can live it. I can write it and and chunk it down into the most accessible, scary parts. Well, you know when i I wrote my chapbook, uh, Junkie Wife, which was published in uh, twenty eighteen. Uh, Moontide Press. Uh, I had tried to write that that book of poems about my first marriage a dozen times, and mm -hmm. I finally looked at it not as a victim of my first husband and my best friend and their affair and all the trauma, but as a willing participant, mm -hmm. not a victim, but someone who gave as good as she got who was mm. as guilty as anyone else. And within three months, the whole book came together. All the poems worked. I wrote a beginning. I wrote an ending. It was edited. And it was published within a year, maybe less. Wow. Um, because yeah. I look at it differently. I was not a victim. I was not this poor woman that ended up on drugs because of things that were done to her. No, I made decisions. I made choices. And I took responsibility and I Ownership. went back and I did it again as a participant. And then it made sense. Yeah. Hmm. Writer as a poet, what a luxury to go right. back 20, 30, 40 years later. Right. And, and, and do it again and do it right. How lucky we are to be poets. I'm grateful every day. Yeah. Too. You know? And I think on that note, uh, we will go out with a bang. Thank you so much for having me on. That's very kind. Very, oh, yeah. very much appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alexis Roan Fancher, for being here and sharing your work. And thank you to all those listeners at the Poetry Salon cast for tuning in. I'll see you next week. We've been talking with Alexis Roan Fancher. If you want to read more of Alexis's work, check out her latest book, Junkie Wife. The poet Sonia Greenfield says of this collection, Alexis Roan Fancher's poems are not for the squeamish, for anyone afraid of dirty words, but they are for anyone who has experienced mismatched desires, for anyone who has looked back at the past and felt relief tinged with regret, and, as Fancher writes in Snapshots and Lies, a miasma of scorching discontent, which means all the rest of us. What, what you will encounter in this collection is the unraveling of a sick marriage and of a wife, but what you will take from the artful telling, careful verse, and precision of details is the understanding that so much good art is born from survival. Thanks for listening to the Poetry Salon cast. If you are a poet with a book out and would like to be interviewed on the Saloncast, send a message to us at admin at thepoetrysalon.com. Please include a PDF of your book, including the back cover blurbs or reviews you've received. And an answer to the question, how do you play rough with a rough draft? 
Once again, send your information and inquiry to admin at thepoetrysalon.com. We look forward to hearing from you, so don't be shy.